and excluding Indians taxed three fifths of all other persons. Now when you now when you get the opportunity, I want you to go back and I want you to review that section. That's in section two, article one of the Constitution. That can be that can be somewhat of some homework, a little bit of research for you to do. I'll read it again right quick. Representatives, representatives and direct taxes shall be apportioned among the several states which may be included within this union according to their respective numbers which shall be determined by adding the whole number of free persons including those bound to service for a term of years and excluding Indians not taxed three-fifths of all other persons. The actual enumeration shall be made within three years after the first meeting of the Congress of the United States and within every subsequent term of 10 years in such manner as they shall be, I'm sorry, shall by law direct. The number of representatives shall not exceed one for every 30,000, but each state shall have at least one representative until such enumeration shall be made. The state of New Hampshire shall be entitled to choose three. Massachusetts, eight. Rhode Island and Providence Plantations, one. Connecticut, five. New York, six. New Jersey, four. Pennsylvania, eight. Delaware, one. Maryland, six. Virginia, 10. North Carolina, five. South Carolina, five. And Georgia, three. How many of y'all heard of Rhode Island and Providence Plantation? So for everybody who has not heard of Rhode Island and Providence Plantation, why don't you write it down and find out what that is? Because you've heard of the state of Rhode Island, and you heard of the state, well, Providence is in, is in Rhode Island right now, but you heard of the state of Massachusetts. Well, Google that and see what that's about. Because it's in the Constitution, so, so that, that term, that word plantation should have caught everybody. When vacancies happen in a representation from any state, the executive authority thereof shall issue writs of election to fill such vacancies. The House of Representatives shall choose their speaker and their other officers, and shall have the sole power of impeachment. Section three, the Senate of the United States shall be composed of two senators from each state, chosen by the legislature thereof, for six years, and each senator shall have one vote. Immediately after they shall be assembled, in consequence of the first election, it shall be divided as equally as may be into three classes. The seats of the senators of the first class shall be vacated at the expiration of the second year, the second class at the expiration of the fourth year, and the third class at the expiration of the sixth year, so that one third may be chosen every second year, and if vacancies happen by resignation or otherwise during the recess of the legislature of, of any state, the executive thereof may make temporary appointments until the next meeting of legislature, which shall then fill such vacancies. Now, you heard me say that they are, they are elected for a period of six years, but at the, sec at the expiration of every second year, that they do elections, one of the first class, and at the fourth year, the second class, and at the sixth year, the third class. You can either Google that, or you can go to the class that we did on the Constitution because I thoroughly broke that down so people would clearly understand. See, when you're talking about people who are making decisions for people, you should know what their jobs are. You should know what their duties are. You should know what their rights and their capabilities are. This Constitution lays it all out right here for you. That can be a bit more homework. No person shall be a senator who shall not have attained the age of 30 years and been nine years a citizen of the United States and who shall not, when elected, be an inhabitant of the state for which he shall have been chosen. The Vice President of the United States shall be the President of the Senate, but shall have no vote unless they be equally divided. The Senate shall choose their officers and also a President pro tempore in absence of the Vice President or when he shall exercise the office of President of the United States. The Senate shall have sole power to try all impeachments. Who has the power of impeachment? No, we just read it. It says the Senate shall have the sole power to try all impeachments. 
So who has the power of impeachment? The House of Representatives. When sitting for that purpose, they shall be on oath or affirmation. When the President of the United States is tried, the Chief Justice shall preside, and no person shall be convicted without the concurrence of two-thirds of the members present. Judgment in cases of impeachment shall not extend further than the removal from office and a disqualification to hold and enjoy any office of honor, trust, or profit under the United States. But the party convicted shall nevertheless be liable and subject to indictment, trial, judgment, and punishment according to the law. Section 4. The times and places and manner of holding elections for senators and representatives shall be prescribed in each state by the legislature thereof. But the Congress may at any time, excuse me, by law, make or alter such regulations except as to the places of choosing senators. The Congress shall assemble at least once every year, and, and such meeting shall be the first Monday in December, unless they shall by law appoint a different day. The Congress shall assemble at least once in every year, and such meeting shall be on the first Monday in December, unless they shall by law appoint a different day. See, when I read that, that makes me think about something, right? Um, when was it that, that they had that, that secret meeting? Christmas Day? What happened? No. We ain't talking Berlin. I'm waiting for somebody to tell me what I'm talking about. The bankers' holiday? Yes. Who? We talking about the bankers' holiday? Yes. What happened? Oh, what happened during the bankers' holiday? What happened? They drafted the Federal Reserve Act. Right. Oh. Right. That was a secret meeting. Yeah, it was a secret meeting. Over Christmas holiday? Oh, Jack Island. But but it's a it's a the Congress shall assemble at least once in every year. And such meeting shall be on the first Monday in December, unless by law they appoint a different day. Mm -hmm. You're right. But they did anyway. Who, who appointed that day? Who appointed that day? Does, yeah, so they didn't meet on the first December to do that. No. And on the first Monday in December to do that. It was Christmas. They did that over the Christmas when, when, when they was on break for Christmas, right? Mm -hmm. Right. 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 Go ahead. And they didn't have the authority to do it anyway. Do y'all get what I'm going? Mm -hmm. Let me take y'all with me. They had a secret meeting in Congress, some senators. They had a secret meeting. And then they came up with, it's not a city, Federal Reserve Act. And they telling you that it's law. Now, we already established that after 1861, that Congress is a fraudulent Congress. That Congress doesn't have the people's best interests. No. That Congress has their pockets best interests, their prosperity's best interests. They don't eat the same food you eat. They don't go to the same food you go to. They don't even got the same health care. Y'all know that they got the, the health care that they Universal. Y'all hear about how much people can't help you? Some people, some people, y'all know what kind of health care they got. Universal. Free. They have care is banking. They can get whatever they need, whatever they want. They can go to whatever doctor, whatever they can go whatever they want. And exactly. They got the health care that you should have. They're supposed to be representing you. But instead, they're taking finance from the pharmaceutical companies, they're taking finance from the insurance companies to pass certain legislation, the certain legislation to keep you where you are. But they're supposed to be representing you. Now, when they take that oath, when they take that oath, when they stand there and they put their hand on that book, and they take that oath, they're supposed to be bound by law, right? Mm -hmm. It don't matter which book it is. I, if I want to, if I want to, I can get Miss Phyllis to hold this, and I can put my hand because it's, it's it's my book, right? This is the book that I believe in. So it don't matter which book it is. I put my hand on it and I hold my right hand up and I say I duly affirm to do this, that, or the third. Now, if I take that oath, 
I'm bound by that oath. And then if I break that oath, then I'm bound by the law. Nobody's, nobody's, nobody calls them the law. Four and oh. Four and oh? What's four and oh? Four is prior to May 10th. Oh, is after May 10th. <coughs> they adopted for, for the foreign corporation that was bankrupt as their private law. And therefore, people can't use it. She missed what you said, Josh. Say it again. She missed what you said. Before, before is the legitimate order set up between the Muslims and the Deists. That's the Republic. After the May 10th of 61, it became of because the corporation that Lincoln bankrupted in 1860, they converted the debt onto our people, and it became private law. You can't use it as a defense, because it's private. The United States of America, the Constitution of the United States is private French law. So we would have to put ourselves back Constitution right? for the United States is American law. It's See, this is your pledge to the Popes of Rome, to the Secret Treaty of Verona, and they set up, when the, when the overthrow took place, they set up a, a kingship oligarchy. And that's what people have been living on. Right. This is why the prophet said I need to get my people back into the Constitutional Court of Government. Actual Constitution. This is why I said to you 20 minutes ago, if you hear me speak of the Constitution, I'm only talking seven articles and ten million rights. I'm not talking about Article Amendment 26. Section 5. Each, each house shall be the judge of the elections, returns and qualifications of its own members, and the majority of each shall constitute a quorum to do business. But a smaller number may adjourn from day to day and may be authorized to compel the attendance of absent members in such manner and under such penalties as the House may provide. Each House may determine the rules of its proceedings, punish its members for disorderly behavior, and, with the concurrence of two-thirds, expel a member. Y'all ever heard of any, any sentences or comments may get kicked out? Nope. Yes. Nope. Yes. He can't get kicked out. He got locked up. Okay. Nope. He got locked up, but they got assassinated 30 years after the fact. Oh. I don't know. I'm just I'm asking y'all. Have y'all ever heard of any of that that now listen, a couple years ago there was a senator who, who was a pervert who got caught in the bathroom stomping his feet for some homosexual acts. Right? Huh? I don't know his name, but y'all know who I'm talking about. You stomp on the floor and that mean I'm with him. Right? So why wasn't he expelled from Congress? Son. So, Lloyd won, brother. James Trafficon. Uh, we already spoke about Trump Con. Uh, oh, see, Trump Con got locked up. Right. After. Right. They, they went after him and put him in jail. Right. Yeah. Right. But they put him in jail for speaking truths. Yes. So I'm not talking about Trump Con. Okay. Trump Con's our friend. Right. I'm talking right. about people like the pervert who didn't get his pen. Oh, right. Who was all over the all over the news. I'm talking about these senators and these congressmen who used who right. used the, the finance that they collect from the people yeah. to travel to Argentina yep. to sleep. You understand? That's yep. what I'm talking yep. about. Yep. 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 Right. But this Constitution is supposed to hold them in check. Yes. But if we don't understand this Constitution and we don't read it, we don't know that. Right. And this is the job of the natural people yes. to use this Constitution to hold these people in check. Right. Come on, bro. It's only been one senator to be impeached, and his name was Senator Blunt, July 7, 1797. Oh, shit. 1797. <laughs> <laughs> shit. Been a whole lot of perverts since then. <laughs> That's a couple years ago. There's still 400 on here. Oh, pedophile. 1980. 1980. Ozzy Myers. Ozzy Myers, what did he do? He uh, accepted money from undercover FBI agents, posing as the Arab chief. They set him up. That's a setup. If he got, if he got, if he got busted for picking up finance from undercover FBI agents, that's a setup. So he probably that's entrapment definitely. He which which is which is a crime, right? Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> right? So now, now the thing is this. Why? Because he, he could have been he could have been ready to whistle blow. He could have been speaking truth. But they all do that. They all take the fight. Listen, all y'all gotta do is, is look, pick your favorite symbol, right? And just look at their left hand. The majority of them are millionaires. Y'all know what their salary is a year? Not at all. Not at all. Who? Not hardly no million. They don't. They get. A, they get six figures, but it's low six figures. They don't make two fifty. They don't make two fifty a year. They're making a lot more than the citizens. Understand my point. Understand my point. That the majority of them are millionaires. The majority, the majority of them are millionaires. Where are they getting that finance? Listen, listen, listen. Miss Phyllis makes one hundred and seventy thousand a year, right? Now, she get one hundred and seventy thousand a year. How long is it going to take her to become a millionaire? Let's just say she get that one set. No, forget it all depends. We use a mathematics. So with mathematics, the only thing that matters is mathematics. Not at all depends. We talking straight to the point, subject matter. If she's getting 170000 a year, how long does it take before, before she becomes a millionaire? It's not 10 years. We're talking 170 million. We're talking seven, six, seven years. For technically for her to become a millionaire, right? Okay. Now, she got a house. She got a couple. Exactly. That's for saving every penny, right? So that's what that brings me to the next one. She got a house, she got a car, she has children, she has bills, she has expenses, she goes on vacation. So now, that 170 done already went down below 100. So how long does it take for her to become a millionaire? They, forget it all depends. I'm talking, listen, listen. It takes a while. Let's forget, let's stop the nonsense. It takes a while. They are all mostly millionaires. They are almost a million. Listen, they all ain't writing books. No, it's not. See, the thing is this. What that senator that she talked about got busted for is what they all do. Y'all go watch House of Cards with Kevin Spacey, because he's snitching. He whistleblowing for real. He's whistleblowing for real. Watch that show called House of Cards with Kevin Spacey. Listen, all of the lobbyists that y'all keep hearing about, Paid them senators to push through legislation. That's how they become millionaires. The same thing that that dude got busted for by the FBI. The FBI can bust all of them. See, I'll give y'all an example. Any of y'all know who Cory Booker is? Yes. Right? Is he a senator then? Yes. Right. He used to be the mayor of Newark or something like that? Yeah. Yes. When he was the mayor of Newark, he was down in the trenches. He used to get his boots dirty. He used to get down in the mud. He like, bro, come on, let me help you up. Come on, let me get you out of there. He became senator. Listen to how he talks now. Somebody done got the court. He getting paid. Look at all of them. Look at all of them. Y'all remember John Street? John Street walked up. Y'all think it's John Street? Y'all think it's John Street was standing right there on on on, on what? Tenth and Tenth and Columbia. Where was his other house? Where was his real house? Y'all think because he was he was serving as a mayor and he stayed at 10th and 10th in Columbia. Oh man, yo, he quit it, man. He put he full of shit. Because he lived, where's his other house? How come he don't live there now? How come he don't live there now? If that was his house, how come he doesn't live there now? He ain't mayor no more. Ain't nobody acting. He don't need them cars sitting out front no more. Why doesn't he still live there? Because he blocked it up. Listen, it was, it was some kind of scandal, maybe two years ago, going on right here in the city, right? And all this time, I was like, man, you ain't heard, I ain't heard from John Street. John Street was the president of the corporation that was on the water river. They all criminals. They all criminals. You know why I say all of them? Because they know they participate in fraud. A treasonous people. John Street was the mayor. I don't know. Oh, that's right. She, you, 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 you are out of town. I forgot. John Street was the mayor. 
Sitting raw. Yes. You say all deal in a fraud, right? Yes. Example is uh, the current mayor, Kenny, right? Huh? The thing with the, sh uh, the sugar tax. That's sugar fraud. Tax. That's fraud. Of course, some of that money is going to the De uh, Democratic Party here in Philly. How, it says the children. They, how can they put a tax on juice? Only juice. What is it, by an ounce? How you put a tax on juice by an ounce? Now, I'm going to tell you what makes me mad. What makes me mad. What's up, Raj? Hey, it's Hi. Islam. Islam. Good to be here. Ms. Raheem, what up, homie? Peace, no. Nice to What's happening? What's up? Glad to be back. In a couple of days, right? Yeah. Yeah. Good to see you. <laughs> only seven, wow. you know. Okay. A couple of weeks. It's only, right, it's only seven. Could say it was a year. It's oh. <laughs> A couple of years. <laughs> oh yeah, I already know about this. Talking about corrupt politicians. And I, this is only the tip of the iceberg, right? So Seth Williams has been fined 62000 for ethics violations, right? Ethics violations. So, so he's under federal indictment. That's the district attorney. Their district attorney. Now? I mean, yes. Yeah. Right now, he's under federal indictment. <laughs> Seth Williams, I just happen to know somebody on the inside of that office. Seth Williams has thrown his guys under the bus. He got a couple of his guys going to jail. Right? But, they, but the things that they did, they were looking out for him. Right? So he's throwing cats under the bus. He got that 62,000 violation for, uh, for ethics violations. But they trying to put the Fed, and that's not from the Fed. That's from the city. That's from the corporation where he got that from. That ain't got nothing to do with the Fed. The Fed's trying to put him away. The Fed's are trying to put Joe Williams away. They both are the federal indictment. The sheriff and the district attorney. Are they related? No. No. In crime. They will be, though, when they be, when they be sharing the booth together. Yeah, they be shouting together. They'll be related then. I'm going I'm to I'm push past them, them, them next few sections so we can all push on. I don't want to infringe upon that dude's time. That's the alarm. I'm out of time. Yeah. Back to that juice. Yeah. Um, what's the we talking about a different tax, James. Well, in Philly. Right, but in Philly. Right, but in, yeah, the sugar tax. In Philly, they put, the, they put any beverage that you buy that has sugar in it. They just packed, I think it was January 1st. Yeah. Or in January, somewhere around there. They have put a tax on it per ounce. Right, so they said they said the uh, six pack of soda that you would normally buy for seven notes is now over ten. Right now, here's where I get pissed off. Here's where I get irritated. Why y'all keep buying? Right. Right. And that proves what? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And that proves what? That proves nothing. If we take sugar and dump it in the river, that proves nothing. But if we don't buy it. If we don't buy it, then you make some noise. Just don't buy no juice. Just don't buy. Listen, if, if you listen, you can go home. You can brew some tea. You can make iced tea, or you can go outside into the county and buy some juice. Don't buy it. If you don't buy it, they don't get. You know what I'm saying? Listen, you got to You got to know. You got to know that anytime you want to hurt them, it's always right here, because that's the only thing they care about. Can y'all quiet down, please? Anytime you want to hurt them, it's going to be in the pot. It's got to be in the pot. Because that's it. It's capitalism for them. Everything is about capitalism. Everything is about finance. For people who smoke, I ain't going to tell you to stop smoking because, the, because from what I understand, it's harder to get off of heroin than it, off of, than it is off of cigarettes. Well, well, easier to get off of heroin than it is to get off of cigarettes. Right, so I'm not going to tell you to say, all right, stop smoking. What I'm going to say is this, don't buy it here. Cripple them. Don't let them cripple you. 
You can cripple them by just not buying. All right, so you so you got to go to you got to drive to shelter him. Big deal. Big deal. Imagine, man, look. Imagine if everybody from, from right here on Broad Street, all the way back to Fish Street, right, and from Alany, all the way down to Erie. Do you know how many people that is? You got a clue how many people live in that little bit of space? You're probably talking ten thousand people. Now, if they don't buy the juice, that's a lot of finance that they're not collecting, right? And then what if they talk to their family, and then we stretch it from Alany down to Lehigh, and from and from Fifth Street all the way up to 21st Street, and then the whole city just stopped buying them, and they were showing them. And then what? Now they are crippled. Now they are crippled. You got to cripple them in their pocket. That's the only thing they understand. You listen. You all right. now. Now I understand the protesting. Go dump the sugar. It might be funny, but it's not going to be effective. You know what I'm saying? So. There's a, there's a book called The History of a Crown. There's a book called The History of a Crown. It might be a little hard to get, but they talk about when saccharin was first being put into, into, the, into, the, into the system, right? Um, I'm thinking it was Eisenhower who was president. And there was a guy who was who was who was heading up the the, the food administration the food administration for the so-called government. And everything that he spoke about, they said was bull. They appreciated everything that he told them about. If he said a certain food was poison, then they said it was poison. If he said a certain food was good, he said then they said the food was good. Now he somebody asked him about sack. When he somebody says something about sack and he just jumped out. And he said, anybody that takes saccharin is an idiot. Anybody that takes saccharin is a fool. Saccharin is toxic, it's poison, it will do this to yourselves, will do this at the third. The president said, whoa, wait a minute. Are you sitting there telling me that saccharin is toxic? And he said, by all means. He said, well, anybody who thinks saccharin is toxic is a fool. Because my doctor's been giving me saccharin for the past couple of weeks, and I take two weeks. So the same man that could have kept saccharin out of the food was deemed an idiot and a fool by the president of the corporation. So then they booted him, and now saccharin was allowed to go just like that. <clears throat> saccharin, aspartame, the whole nine. All of that splinter, all of that other kind of sugars, and all of them things you use. All of that stuff, toxic. If you think that because you get a diet drink that you did yourself some good reading lately, Aspartame, chewing gum, aspartame, candy, aspartame. You listen, find out if they put aspartame in rat poison. Yep. They yep. might. Yep. Yep. It's poisonous. It's toxic. Yep. The easiest thing to do, y'all, if you want to rebel, rebel with people. I ain't even get a chance to get into this. I apologize. You know, we just be, we be gone. But I'll keep this. I'll bring this back to the next class. Yes? You don't have this? That's what happens right here. Don't hold on to this. We, we, gonna, we gonna get at this. We got to. I want to, Abdullah, Abdullah said he needed a uh, bit of time, so I don't want to 
Not allow my man to have a son. That's, 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 that's my teacher. That's like my, my mentor when I came in more science. So whatever he's ready, we'll bring him up. But before, before we bring him up, any questions about anything? Before we, we want to bring that bill up? Any comments? Yeah. Want to walk up? So I don't know where they are. But, so, there was a request for um, so we can bring in more. A request that we can bring in more? Yeah. I request you all go on Amazon and get it. All that? I will wait. You ready? All right, come on. <clears throat> I'm going to talk to y'all for a minute. Y'all already know, man, this dude, this, dude, this dude was my teacher, my mentor for a solid two years. Gave me, gave me all kinds of tools, all kinds of instruments. Got me ready to stand up here in front of y'all and talk to y'all. But y'all know for, for a long time, his focus was here on this book called Boys and Mason. And he finally finished it. And he finally got it published. Actually, I ain't even going to say he finished it because it ain't finished yet. Next one, we got plants. It ain't finished yet. It's still five parts coming. This is just the first part. This is just the beginning of it, right? So you're just getting your feet wet with this book. But boys, basically, Abdullah will tell you it's his life's work. And um, support it. Get the book. I think he got some copies of it. I might have, I got one copy left up here. If he don't have it, I'll go back there. But um, yeah, I can't say enough about this dude. I like to call him a walking encyclopedia. Cause that's just what the brother is, but um, he's solid. He's a solid author. He's a solid teacher. He's a solid dude. So I'm gonna turn the mic over and give it up to my man. I do it to be most of Yes, it's finally done. This is uh, part one, part two. We we'll get out at the end of the year. Part two, more to make sure. All right. Uh, I was in Columbus, Ohio for a book signing, or at Columbus, Ohio for a book signing last weekend. And uh, it, it was very, very interesting and quite a few questions were thrown at me. Um, when the first book, when the book first came out, I took it to the Black and Nobel and there was a brother there who asked me a, a battery of questions about the, uh, the information, though I was coming from a scholarly perspective, he was not. He had no information to support his claims, all right? His claim was that we didn't enslave Europeans. His claim is that, you know, we had no wars with any Europeans or any Africans or anybody. We lived in a utopia, you know what I mean? There was no wars and no tribute payments, no... I said, well, where did you get your information from, brother? Support your claim. Of course, he could support his claim. Sister Delilah in 2010, I don't know if you remember this, she asked me, and I was doing teaching the Moors about my research at Thindies. She asked me in 2010 about did I have any, did I find any documentation on land battles, battle on land in North America, Central Africa, with Boston Europeans. Because uh, we, my research led me to see battles, tribute payments, captivity, ransom, all right? That was in 2010, almost seven years ago. I think I remember that. So, so I focused my thesis around showing we examine the transatlantic slave trade story. The question that I posed when I was at Columbus, Ohio, what would it take for the, the Spaniards, which are the Castilians and the Aganese, the Dutch, the Spanish, the uh, Portuguese, and the English and French, to transport 10 million, maybe four or five million, well, they go Africans from the continent of Africa to North America, Central America, and South America. One, you would have to have sea power. 
We're not talking about the number of ships, whether it's possible or not. You first have to have control of the seas. I am going to show you with documentary evidence that the Spaniards, the French, the Dutch, the, the um, Portuguese, going to fifth, even back to the 10 hundred, 11 hundred, 1200, 13, 14, 1600, did not have control of the seas like that. One of my co-workers asked me in September 2011, when I was talking to him, it was the first day of school at Ojo Wilson. He asked me, he said, Mr. I was talking about my research for the book. He asked me, history teacher, a brother. He asked me, Mr. Bay, how did the Europeans come to world power and dominance? That's easy. How? By defeating the Moors. That's documented. Now because when people come at me, because they don't know it doesn't mean information doesn't exist. That's, that shows the limitation of their research. They don't base what you base your limitation all right, on me. Because you don't know it doesn't mean it's not so. That's not scholarly. It's not scholarly. All right? Now, so I'm just throwing these points at you before I get warmed up here. So I'm going to give you some points into which to re-examine your fancy land slave trade when you talk to your family members, co-workers, friends, or whomever, so-called scholars, or whoever you want to call them. All right? I'm going to give you some points of reference. All right? So now, I'm going to write this on the board. Can you bring yourself some more? Is this too far back? All right, need some help, please. Can I have some help, please? Some help, please? Like right here. Thank you. Oh, I didn't know. All right. Quick. Uh, all right, there you go. Good, good. I, I don't want to be way back there. I'm looking at points to analyze. Points. I had markers too. To analyze. Alright. Should be treating to write these down. Should be treating. the best kings and queens of Europe, France, the Netherlands to intervene or to negotiate the release of their loved ones, how they voice captivity. So petition. Uh, okay. Okay. European redemption. European redemption orders.
redemption missions. We're being sent out on redemption missions to negotiate the release and pay for the ransom, to, for the release of Europeans held in Moorish captivity. Information is not known to the general public. Points to analyze the transatlantic slave trade story in this context. In order for the Portuguese, the, the Spaniards, the French, the Dutch, the back and forth, see, the people, what we're taught or indoctrinated into believing is that the European powers, you know, the African kings and queens sold Africans into slavery to the Europeans. The Europeans would go back and forth, back and forth, year after year, 10,000, 20,000, 40,000, 50,000, 7,000, 200,000, 500,000, 300,000, 2 million, 4 million, back and forth. No discussion about wars. No discussion about their ships being seized by us. No discussion of Moors having Europeans held in captivity. No discussion of this. Come on, African scholars. But yeah. But yeah. This is major point of analysis. Major. We don't go past this. This is major. One of the um, questions that was posed to me at Columbus. One of the brothers asked me, he said, uh, he's, well, he's actually he made a statement, but it wasn't a question. He said that the Europeans have been controlling the world for over 2,000 years. I said, that's a lie. That's a lie. Back that up. He said, over 2,000 years, right? Over 2,000 years. So it's what? 2,000 So from 7 11. What? 1492. That's, that's before 2000 years ago, right? That's before 2000 years ago. That's 7 11, 1492. There is a three volume book called The History of the Moorish Empire in Europe, S.P. Scott, volumes 1, 2, and 3. We have the Stanley Poe, who Moors in Spain. Moors after Spain. Stanley Poole and J.D. Lieutenant J.D. Kelly. I'm going to read something from you for you. This is a book review. This is Linda Cowley's, Linda Cowley Professor of History at Princeton University. She taught at Yale in the 70s. Her co-workers, her colleagues, European male colleagues, verbally attacked her. They are they angry, angry about the exposure of this information. Why? They're the colleague, European, well claimed in her field. She recognized well claimed awards and wars upon wars. Right? She has a book called Captive Empire, Britain, Empire, and the World. I'm going to read part of a book summary, book review. Then Dark Rimpo is that he wrote the book review. And I have I referenced her in my book, More Than Masonry. Now. 
William, William Dalrymple is fasted by Linda Collins, that's C-O-L-L-E-Y, the God tale of British defeats in India and North Africa and captives. However, this captives Britain empire in the world, 1600 to 1850. 1600 to 1850, so now that's before 2000 years ago, right? However, we may be by our former Raj, R-A-J means what? Ruler, that's, that's Sanskrit, Raj, A-A-R-A-J, Her heroes, those have locks and not Pierre's swaggering emperorsly on their plinths and tacklers square or starting potentially ossified and cocky clay all the way up White Hill. All right. Colleagues' thesis is that the unprecedented military success and world political and economic domination achieved by the Victorian British has blinded us to the smallness and vulnerability of Britain in the preceding two and a half centuries. After all, she points out, as late as 1715, the British army was no longer than that commanded, no, no, no larger than that commanded by the King of Sardinia, while the same period, there were at least 20,000 British civilians enslaved in the Barbary softness of North Africa. All right? It is significant that this surprises, it is significant that this surprises us as much as it does. It is as if the Victorians colonized not just one quarter of the globe, but also, more permanently, our imagination to the exclusion of all other images of British encounter and collision with the wider world from the Elizabethan period onward. Colony shows the extent to which tales of British weakness and defeat at the hands of the sophisticated Muslim states in North Africa, the Middle East, and India have been constantly edited out of the historical record. Tremendous naval power. How can they get the same thing slave trade off? By covering this up. I'm mentioning it. So what's edged in our minds is that we came from Africa. What they also, now really and look at this. It showed, it presents us in a position of weakness. Weakness. Look at how the Europeans reconstruct history. It is all when when there is in any writings. This is from so-called African scholars too. When there is any writings about the Asiatics and Europeans, it's either they're shooting us, they have us in chains, show pictures, or documentaries. All right, they're, they're lynching us. They're putting us in the holes and galleys. It's never this. You never see anything like this. No discussion, no images like this. No pictures like this. You never see any pictures like this in the public. In fact, Ali, brother who hosted the class at Maryland, he said, I'm going to put this on Facebook. Man, you don't see this nowhere, nowhere, no pictures like this, nowhere. Dog on right, why not? Go on, African scholars. Go on, African scholars. So this concept of this European world power and domination. So in 1100s, 12, 13, 1400s, 15, 1600s. Download your free Morris Directory app today.
1600s. So, take me here. Now, the transatlantic slave trade story claim is that the Europeans transported 10 million Africans from the continent of Africa to the Americas from the 1500s to the 1800s. All right? Also, during which time the, the European powers were colonizing the Americas. So what I did was, I analyzed, I placed this information in that time period. Yes. I'm gonna continue. I'm gonna read some points in the book. I'm gonna go to the bibliography, page 207. One of the questions that was asked is there a lot of is there a lot of research material in the subject matter? Dog all right there is. All right? I'm going to just read some points on the bibliography. Now Bir Matar, who teaches at history professor at University of Minnesota, Islam in Britain, 1558 to 1685. Paul, Paul Baylor, the, the Barbary Captivity Narrative in Early America. White Slaves, African Masters, an Anthology of American Barbary Captivity Narratives. W. Lord Close, The Naval War, A History from the Earliest Times to the Present, Seven Volumes. London, 1897 to 1903. Quote from the book, at least 466 English ships were, was with perhaps 5,600 English men were taken between 1609 and 1616. White Gold, the extraordinary story of Thomas Pello and Islam's one million white slaves by Charles Milton. Christian captives at the hard at hard labor in Algeria, 16th to 18th century, International Journal of African Historical Studies. Linda Colony, captives: the story of Britain's pursuit of empire and how its soldiers and civilians were held captive by the dream of global supremacy, 1600 to 1850. Michael Boussole, Slaves and Englishmen, Human Bondage in the Early Modern Atlantic World. Kenneth Parker, Reading Barbary in Early Modern England, 1550 to 1685. Catherine N. Steyer, Barbary Pirates, British Slaves in the Early Modern Atlantic World, 1570 to 1800, PhD dissertation, University of Pennsylvania, 2009. All right. Turks, Moors, and Englishmen in the Age of Discovery. All right. Uh, Warfare at Sea, 1500 to 1650, Maritime Conflict and the transformation of Europe. Ottoman territoriality versus maritime usage. The Ottoman Islands and English privateering, privateering in the wars with France, 1689 to 1714. Robert C. Davis, Christian slaves, Muslim masters, white slaves in the Mediterranean, the Barbary Coast in Italy, 1500 to 1800. In fact, on the back, I cover, I quote Robert Davis, professor of, of history at Ohio State University. The Englishman, the enslavement of Europeans doesn't fit the general theme of European world conquest and colonization that is central to scholarship on the early modern era. People say, black and whites and slaves? Surprisingly, they'll say. 
all right? Spanish captives in North Africa in the early modern age. Now, these all also have state records. This is from the National Archives. They call state papers. State papers are these are letters and diplomatic relations correspondence between us and European powers. All right. Question before I go on. Does it make sense? I don't know what I'm talking about. When they want to say they don't know, I don't know what I'm talking about. They have to show me. Same and means nothing to me. That means nothing. Nothing. Show me, do documentary evidence, or show me what I have in this book. It's not substantiated. Abdullah. Right? Question. Abdullah. Yes. During the uh, Crusades, what time period was that? You're looking at 1100s to 1350, or 1100 to 1250. All right, let's talk about that. 14, from 700, from 711 to 1492, we control our Andalusia. Not, not only what they call Spain, but other parts, southern France, and early 700s, all right, Greece, all right, Italy, so, we, so Portugal, so that in Cordova, we had a library that housed 600,000 books. Now, Ivan Sertoba, Ivan Sertoba edited the book, The Golden Age of the Moors. There's 40 pages of bibliography. There's 20 articles. There's a compilation of 20 articles. You know, Evan Scobie, Ivory Serpent has two articles, Wayne Chandler, Jose Pimiente Bay, uh, Winogo Rashidi, but not one talks about this. They talk about the contribution of medicine, surgery, poetry, philosophy. They, 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 they talk about wars, tribute payments, ransom. My question is, why not? They do this. 40 pages of bibliography. 40 pages. 40. Not four. 40 pages of bibliography. 40 in the Golden Age of the Moors. Why? Bonogovashi. Jose Pimiente Bay. He did a three hour lecture on YouTube. In a three hour lecture, Jose Pimiente Bay, Temple University dissertation, now at somewhere in Virginia. He's only talked for three minutes about this. He talked about the contribution, but there's three minutes on this. Why's that? Oh yeah, you know, yeah, when you know Europeans, you know, say that we had the old slavery not do as a counter, you know, I mean it balance things off, you know. I say that, you know, my answer is that don't sleep. And then I'm saying he didn't do a lecture on it. It wasn't, it was just that that he went on. This that should be the major issue. I'm talking, I, I got you. My point is what they're not saying, not what they're saying. What they're not saying. Why is this the information? Why is this the focus on the contribution? I'm down with that, that's fine. I give kudos to Iris Sertima, Edward Scobie and them, yes. But why not this? Yes. They're not going to reveal, they, so they're only revealing a certain amount of information, i.e. the surgery to thesis, the uh, philosophy and poetry, and, you know, that is, they reveal that. They, I mean, it's extensive. The Golden Age of the Moors is extensive. I mean, they, I mean, 40 pages of bibliography, that is extensive. I highly recommend we get that. But there was no discussion on 
our enslaved European, no, no, nothing like this. I don't hear any African scholars talking this at all. Yes. I remember uh, when uh, Ivan came to the temple, the secretary talked to me because I, I uh, talked to him and I asked him, why don't you just tell these people that they're Moors and stop mixing the black thing? And, and I talked about the bond bills. Mm -hmm. And he said, um, there's enough information that they should figure it out. He said, if you tell them directly, they'll report it. All right. All right, he still had a choice, though. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he still had a choice. And others, too. know that, too. Yeah, I mean, Same thing with Dr. Mm -hmm. Ben. You know how many co-workers said, you know how many people said to me? Over 50 people have said to me, they're going to get you. Over the past, when I put this book cover out five years ago, co-workers were afraid, shaking, nervous for me. I'm standing right now with this book in my hand. I got a choice. I got a choice. All right? So you still got a choice. Well, I'm not going to write the book. They're going to kill me. And? 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 All right, you can't tell the truth, no problem. 
Don't say nothing at all. Don't say nothing at all. Don't write no books. But he wrote books. He pushing the lie. Don't write no books. If you're not gonna tell the truth, don't say nothing. I mean, that's my position. Don't say anything. But if you make your finance, it's pushing the lie. And say, you know, see, you want to do what it got to be told the truth. But he made finance pushing the lie. I mean, it's keeping real, y'all. Let's keep it real. I mean, come on. Yes. I care rat's ass what he was. I care rat's ass what he was. I give rat ass what he wants. How about Mom's keysters? <laughs> I ain't making no damn excuses. <laughs> Stop that! <laughs> Continue right along. Do we have this? Yeah. All right, good, good. <laughs> oh, I had a discussion with, um, Friday night with a brother, it's Thursday night, and I um, told the phone, Marvin Dean's uh, uncle. I know Marvin Dean for years, I was. And he, I was explaining to him about the, my book, and my research, and showing him, presenting my information to prove that remorse without a shadow of doubt. He listened to me, but didn't digest what I said to him. I talked about the tremendous naval power, Moorish naval power, during the time period of the 15, 16, 1700, even went back to Moorish controlling our Andalusia and other parts of Europe. 700, 800, 900, 11, 1200. And he went on, when his tank turned to speed, he talked about two or three, four thousand years ago. All right, let's, let's take an etymological approach. When an etymologist traces a word, all right, to its origin, they don't start five thousand years ago. They don't start five, ten thousand, two thousand. All right, this is the current form of the word. How did this word, this form, get to this? So they what? They don't do this 5,000 years ago, all right? So why are you jumping? Well, I do, I backstab. Who, what European powers, what's the thing, have purported to transport Africans to the Americas? Name them. In English. Those five had wars with us. Tributes, ransom payments. Let's back that now. Let's back that. Who's in control now? The occupying power called the United States. Now, Michael Warren, here we go. How did they how did they build up their naval power? Their naval, their navy. Read about Michael Orr and So let me let's let's do this back step now. The occupying power, United States occupying power, that are occupying our land, that colonizing and occupying Moorish land. What are they doing? Let's talk the state of affairs. The state of affairs of the Moroccan Empire today is on the European power, European occupation and colonization. That's a fact. Let's talk. Let's go to Michael Orr. Michael Oren, Columbia University, Columbia University, not student, former student, graduate of Columbia University. His, he went back and did a lecture. His, he made his professor's mouth drop. St students were shocked by that information. Let me read it. Go right to it. We're not Moors? All right. 
Let's do this back step now. Michael. Oh, here it is. Columbia News. Here it is. Columbia News. Now, this is not, well, this will be a more spacey part two, because in more spacey part two, this with the this with the history, diplomacy, and consul relationship, consul relations between the Iraqi Empire and the United States between 1770 and 1850. That's part two. Part two, part one is the diplomatic relations between the Moroccan Empire and European powers, 1500s to 1800s. That's what this book's about. Let me read this. Columbia News. The Middle East and the making of the United States, 1776 to 1815. Speech by Michael B. Orman, B.A., 77, M.I.A., 1978. Senior Fellow, the Shalene Center, delivered at Columbia University on November, November 3rd. And they didn't have the year indicated. November 3rd. I'm just going to read the article, some of it. Just over 20 years ago, when I, was, when I was a graduate student in Middle East Studies, I heard a lecture on a group of Civil War veterans, Northerners, and Confederates who had served as advisors to the Egyptian army in the late 1860s and 1870s. Not only did they modernize Egypt's defenses, the professor said, but they also built schoolhouses to teach literacy to Egyptian soldiers and their children. I was stunned. Like most Americans, I assumed that our country's involvement in the Middle East began shortly after World War II. With the advent of the Cold War, the expansion of Gulf oil production, and the emergence of Arab-Israeli Arab conflict, it never occurred to me that the United States was interacting substantively with the Middle East in the middle of the 19th century and, and perhaps earlier. It went, I went on to devote my academic career to the history of the United States of Israel and the diplomacy of Arab-Israel Israeli conflict. Yet, throughout, I maintained this closeted fascination with the history of America in the Middle East. I was fascinated by the diplomatic and military dimensions of that history. Did you know, for example, that the U.S. Marines landed no less than four times in the Middle East in the 19th century alone, as well as by cultural history, by the impact of the Middle East on the writings of Washington Irving and Herman Melville on the Murray Emerson and Mark Twain. I found that America's involvement in the Middle East followed this distinct patterns, three themes that I later labeled power, faith, and fantasy. Power referred to the search for economic and strategic advantages in the Middle East, faith related to the role of religion, and the particular positivism in America's Middle East interaction, and fantasy pertained to the contribution of popular myth, myths about the Middle East and the foundation formation of America perception of the policies toward the region. All right, let me just let me skip on. The only question was where to begin. I considered opening my study with the journey of John Ledyard, the, form, the first American to explore the Middle East in the late 1780s, or with the first American missionaries to the Middle East, who left Boston in 1819. Only when I started researching in depth did I realize that the roots of the relationship went deeper still to the bedrocks of the American independence and identity and that of the Middle East played a formative role in the making of the United States. America's involvement in the Middle East, I learned, began on, on one January, July 4th, then nearly 230 years ago, when the United States suddenly faced the world in the Middle East alone. Prior to that day, American merchant ships had safely sailed the oceans, confident of the protection of history's deepest, greatest navy, 
Britain's 800 warship storm. I want to show you that's a lie. Britain's wake them, so that's a big one. I'm going to bust that one up. That safeguard was especially important for America, Americans, most of whom were centralized, concentrated along the eastern seaboard with its deep water ports and excellent shipbuilding timber. A seafaring people heavily depended on foreign trade. I'm just skipping. For about 600 years, from the 13th to the 17th centuries, the pirates of, of Orcasiers of Barbary preyed on European commerce, taking thousands of prisoners and selling them as slaves in the mines or the galleys. European women were especially prized for their light complexion, fetching premium prices in their hands. Though prisoners could, in theory, be ransomed, the going rates for redemption were invariably high. The lives of most of the, of the slaves, by contrast, were brutal, cruel, and mercilessly, mercifully short. Early colonial Americans also fell victim to pirate attacks, the first being recorded in 1628, only eight years after the Plymouth landing, with recurrence throughout the century. Of the 390 English captives ransomed from Algiers to 16 in 1680, 11 were residents of New England and New York. Such incidents diminished, however, over the course of the 18th century as Europe surged ahead of the Middle East technology militarily, and, the, and as Britain developed its unprecedented and unparalleled naval power. Continue. Uh, In 1786, John Jefferson was serving as America's minister to France and in that capacity. He came up with the idea of forming an international coalition together with European powers to combat Barbary. He even got his old friend, Marquise de Lafayette, to place the proposal before the various European courts. The Europeans Though, while roundly applauding the idea, just went on paying tribute. Like mm. Oregon. The French rejected the very notion of coalition. Jefferson concluded that if were to obtain peace, the United States had to act unilaterally. All right, I'm going to end there. All right, so what I, what I show in Moore's Ministry Part 2. As Michael already talked about, what he didn't do, what he didn't mention here, the tribute treaties between England and Morocco protected the English colonial ships. This relationship, this is heavy man. So they don't know who the Moors are. Huh? Moors who? Morons. Moors? More. So the evidence would be treaties, letters, ambassadors, caliphs, emperors. Who are we? What did the Europeans had? So someone's, my, my question would be, we claim to be whatever. My question, can you prove that? What's the history? Give me some history of this nation ever existing. Questions? Okay. You're welcome. I'm gonna be here. How much time do I have? I'm gonna, two, all right, I'm gonna go right to the few and dive in. All right. Is this useful? Just wasting my time. Yes. Slave American trade. They changed the name from trans American trade to slave trade to something else. Do you want two names for that? Because they they didn't want you to know that the Europeans are slaves. 
So we call it something else before we put it something else. I have died. Yeah, the thing is, I have, I don't know what you just call it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I man, this part here. in the treaties, you mentioned that van, you'll see that van right here. Thank you. Let me explain what this is. The Shriners use that. The Shriners call it, they use the term imperial divan for the structure of the organization. Where did the Shriners get that from? Did I originate with the Shrine? I showed you documentary evidence through trees that this not did not win with the shrine. I mean B 54. I think I'm making this up. This is Treaty of Peace between England and Algeria. November 10th, 1662, Article, Article 2. If a controversy arises between an Englishman and a Turk, then that man shall decree justly concerning it and sh shall use their endeavor that the quarrel may be accommodated and that right and justice be administered to whom it is due. That's, we have here Articles of Peace and Commerce between Great Britain, Tripoli, signed Tripoli, uh, March 15, 1676. In the first place, it is agreed and concluded that from this day and forever forward, there be a true, firm, and invaluable peace between the most serene king of Great Britain, France, and Ireland, defender of the Christian faith, and the most illustrious Lord, and Bashar de Alga Divine, and the governors of the city and the kingdom of Tripoli and Barbary, and between all the king dominions and subjects of either side, and that the ships or the other vessels and the subjects of, of people of both sides shall not henceforth do to each other any harm, offense, or injury, either, either in word or deed but shall treat one another with all possible respect and friendship. All right, so that's reference to, to Iran. This here is the Moorish Council. This is the executive, all right, The your Europeans today, the United States occupying power, substituted Divan for presidential cabinet. Donald Trump, Donald Trump is the substitute Grand Wazir. Someone asked me, I was on a radio show uh, back in uh, I think I, July, August. They broadcasted a radio show. I was on, on, on the phone, and the brother um, Tahuti, Tahuti, he had me on the phone, and I, I was at the gallery at the time. And, um, it was being broadcast live from the, the, the radio station and at the, at the class in uh, restaurant in Melbourne. So he asked me, "How does the the upcoming election?" What does all the compilation have to do with the Moors? I said it has everything to do with the Moors. That whoever is going to be elected is going to be elected to the Moorish seat. We keep thinking, thank you, that the seat belongs to them. Donald Trump is a substitute Grand Vizier. They use the title president. This structure's been in place. They established this structure, family. 
This church has been in place for a couple thousand years. They didn't establish this. They didn't establish any structure. They're using your structure of government. They just substituted what? They, the Majlis. The Majlis is the legislative branch. So, so they don't, so they don't, they don't say divan. They say president of capital. So the head of the divan would be the grand wazir. I'll write it down. Different spellings. W. W. A. C. I. R. B. I. C. I. R. B. I. C. I. E. R. Based on the language. All right. Substitute. That's what Donald, Donald Trump is functioning. Is this? Donald Trump is functioning as a substitute band by zero. The seat that Donald Trump is in right now is the seat of the Moorish man right there, the seat. He, United States Representative, Donald Trump, United States Representative, the seat is not United States. That's not a United States seat. If, you, if we had if we had our seats band on right now, and you say, yeah, look at the United States government. Ho, 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 I kill that. So watch the C-SPAN, right? And you are in that Capitol Hill, right? And you say, look at the United States government. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. We gotta qualify that. No, 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 no. That's too. No, no, no. Can't do. No, no, no. Can't do that. No, no, no. I kill that. If you say, look at the United States representatives, ah, then we're cool. We say United States government. The seat that they're in, the building that they're in, the building that they're in is yours. The building that they're in is yours. The building in the United States. So you can't say United States government loosely like that. This is how they think, traded places with us. And we, five minutes? Oh, question. <laughs> you were a time man, you know? No, 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 no. So if, if we're not going to say the United States, then how should we say it? No, 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 I didn't, no, no. I'm not saying don't say United States. Let me, let me, right, let me tell you. No, no, no. Right, let, let, me, let me pause, let me do it again. Let me, let me, let me, let me do it again. Question, then. You said don't say United States government loosely, right? right? Because, because the building is not the United States. Right. right. But if someone's talking about that government, how should they say it? If they're not going to say the United States government. No, 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 the United States is not a government, so they won't be talking about, if, all right, if you say somebody's talking about that government, they won't be talking about the United States then. It's like the corporation. Yeah, they, they, if, they, if the word government comes out their mouth, you know that they're not talking about the United States. In their mind, all right. In their mind they're saying, they're thinking United States, in their mind. But they're incorrect. You don't, government, the term United States and government don't go together. That, one of these things don't belong. The term United States and government don't go together. You say, if somebody writes this, if you see this in, if you see this, that's wrong all day long. I know what they say. I'm talking about God. See, don't tell me what they say, they occupiers. Don't tell me what the occupiers say. I know what the occupiers say. I'm talking about y'all. You don't say that. You don't say that. Yes, millions of people say that. They have been indoctrinated with false history to say that. One of my former co workers said to me, he said, I was playing to him through documentary evidence. I showed him the documentary evidence. All right? Constitution, Coinage Act. I showed him the documentary evidence that this is not a dollar. His response to me was, Mr. Bay, 
but everybody in the school costs us a dollar. Oh, 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 fam. I'm showing you through documentary evidence. Corner Jacks, 1792. United States Constitution. Through documentary evidence that this is not a dollar. Your response to me is what? That everybody in the school, Mr. Bay, except you, calls us a dollar. That's unintelligible. That's non-scholarly. You're basically, whether this is a dollar or not, based on what? I just showed you subpoena all the land. Wow. Corny Jack. All right? So because many of the people say this, all right, millions of people, millions of people, Say, yeah, Americans, United States citizen. Yeah, you American? Oh, you United States citizen. Oh, yeah, you American? All right. Show me, you cannot show me that this occupying power. All right, let me write this down. So we can... This is in the book called American or United States Citizen. It's coming up, sister. I will talk to this out next week. You will not show, you will not see in any official documents this. For example, download your free Morse Directory app today. You will not see in any building in the world, on a sign or on the building, anywhere in the world, this. In the world. In the world, I'm sorry, American Embassy. Embassy. If you do, please show it to me. Go up your phone, please. Come back on the phone. I'm challenging you all. Please show it. I want you to show me a building anywhere in the world. Show me a building anywhere in the world. I'm challenging you. That has this one is fine outside the building. Show it. Show it to me. <coughs> don't say, I just want you to show it. I don't want you to tell me that it is. Show me a building. Anywhere in the world that has that, or this. This is simple, y'all. Simple. Show me that. Any building in the world. They just say it. They say it. They don't write it. They ain't stupid! We are! They don't like this! They'll be challenged with this! American Navy. American Army. Show me. American citizen. Show me. Show me. Show me. Any level head? Anything. Name plate, United Nations, yeah. And United Nations, they won't even say this. Stand up for me, brother. <laughs> so you go announce the ambassadors, right? To United Nations. Next, I'm going to bring in the American ambassador to the United Nations. They'll never. They won't say, uh, they won't say, American ambassador to the United, United Nations. I got it. They won't say that. Why not? Why not? Because they know what the name American truly ties to. And they only play that game with our people because we, we're not in a position to challenge their, their claim is just verbal. They really aren't making a claim. All right, truthfully, family, they aren't really making a claim that they're Americans. They're not. They, I got you. They're not, they're not making a claim that they're Americans. Saying it, they, not, they haven't written it down. I'm talking about writing it down. They can say it. They can say it. Show me the documentary evidence 
in writing where they may be clean. In writing. Show me a federal statute. Show me a federal statute that reads American shall mean United States citizens. Show me a federal statute. So they, they claim they will not make it clean. And writing. Go ahead, Todd. Remember when they introduced Bill Clinton at the UN, they said the American president and the president of Mexico immediately they go rebutted. Mm -hmm. That was invited. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. He rebutted. Oh. And made them make the correction. Yep. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Not American. Not American. Exactly. Can somebody name for me an American state? Someone. Mexico. No, 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 not. <laughs> for the future, for future. All right, yeah. I do this for the future. Taj. Ross Mariah. Miz. Annie. Second row, I got a name because they. Please do not answer. Please do not answer. I already know y'all. The question's not for y'all. Let me try it again. Can someone name, other than the people I say, please, an American state? Other than I said, I said the liar. I didn't miss your name. Is someone named for me an American state? Colombia. Colombia. Mexico. Guatemala. North Carolina. South Carolina. Florida. Mm. Massachusetts. No. Mm. And they're not even listening. Officially, only with somebody or somebody who lies, or not officially as a member state, but Brazil, Mexico, and the rest are officially listed, documented as American states. There's an organization called the Organization of American States. North Carolina is not a member. Florida, New Jersey, Massachusetts, all right, are not listed as American states. Yes. Okay, so, because I'm kind of confused just a little bit. Um, so when they say the states of America, being that they use the word of, all right. The states of America. Let's analyze that. Let's analyze it from that. States. That's several based on its syntax. This is functioning as a gen genitive. Is that Since childhood, 
Yeah. We're going to have a geography test. Right. Yeah, we're going we to identify the state. First, we're going to learn to identify the 13 columns. So you see, we got you. Land, see, and time. See, that's a lot. So that's been indoctrinated. See, they got us at the young age, though. Now keep in mind, the young age. That's why you said that. Like, if you were taught the truth from day one, yeah. All right, so you have been, see, it's the false foundation there that's in your mind. New Jersey has nothing to do with land. It doesn't, it's, so it's not New, New Jersey State of America. It's not tied to America. America is the landmass. That includes North America, Central America, South America. So if you were born in the area of South America, in one of the, let's say, uh, American state of Brazil, it would be probably said you would be born in America. And that's a fact. So we have to bring these, we have to bring these issues. These European bases are not going to help us. They're not going to help us. I can convince I have a better chance, and I'm doing it, to convince our brothers and sisters who are making the stars to help us. I have no fighting chance, none, to convince European Masons to help me. None. Why would European Masons help me now? When I work, when I, at him, at him, also at Philadelphia, construction sites. I walk by, I see European males. I see European males. Our brothers and sisters are in jails. Yep, yep, yep. I'm talking about Camden, downtown, I can't now Camden. Yep, yep. Our brothers and sisters are in the jails. Our brothers and sisters are what, selling Lucy's, are they find Dunkin' Donuts, Rite Aid, I know what I'm talking about. Yep. Yep. I said, I know what I'm talking about. Yep. All right? So, clarified chicken. Yep. Like, you want to buy Lucy? Sell the drugs. Yep. European males across the street, been there for two years. 95% uh -huh. European males, new trucks. Why would those European males, just, I'm, I'm practical, I'm practical, thank you now. Walk with me. Why would those European males help me raise those people across the street? I'm, going, I'm at the construction site now. I'm taking the most information to the construction site. They got new, they live in suburbs, new trucks. The trucks ain't over than five years old. Yeah. All right? I'm going to go to the construction site now. Now I'm going to convince them, European males, live in suburbs. They see other like, people across the street now. The jail, behind the building is the jail. Right? Now I'm going to convince them. Yeah, you know, you see this? Yeah, who are these imposters? So they look at themselves. Come on, that's imposters. Yeah, you know, yeah, the term, the pure that man, that belongs to these people across the street. Sovereign man commander, where am I an art? They belong to the people across the street. The land is going to belong to the people across the street. Well, those European males, they see their cars, new cars, they live in suburbs. Well, they be so far out to help them. I'm practical, I'm practical, thank you, y'all. I'm gonna be breaking down, I'm practical. Why, what is it, they have no vested interest right now. I didn't say 10 years from now. I'm talking about right now, next year, two years from now. They don't have a vested interest. You, they, they ain't stupid. I'm talking about returning the power to people across the street. They see those people across the street every day. On the stores, selling looses, drugs, every day. In fact, they walk by when they go to Dunkin' Donuts. When they go in the break, Dunkin' Donuts stuff. All right? Little peons and get me in homeless and they put their nose down to them. You know what I mean? All that. All right? You think they're going to? They won't be in the same position. Let's be, keep it real. They will not be in a position politically. Culturally, economically, military, you name it. It don't belong to them. 
They belong to us by birthright. They don't have, wouldn't have a vested interest. Because they would be helping me get them out of power. I can at least convince my brothers and sisters, facing these thoughts, to help. Why? It belongs to them. Yes. Five minutes. Time to go. All right, let's cut it. I want to thank you again. All right? Until next time. Peace. That's the book for sale. 50 notes for the book. The DVD is about the book, too. This is 15 for the DVD. I have the back. All right? Thank you. Thank you, brother. Before we, uh, before, we, before we back up the meeting, there's some people waiting outside. We'll just make a couple of oh, right. announcements. Oh, Vince, it's Vince's. Come on, sign it. We got another number for the, uh, another calling number for MHHS. Um, yeah, let me show New number. Seven is right here. Just, just explain to them that, and just explain to them when we do that, is that the old number that we had for years, the um, uh, block talk decided to change, and when they changed it, just to show you how these modern Europeans think about commerce and money and finance only, the old number that we had, sister, the old number that we had, if you call it, they will say to you, that the line is filled, right. and if you want to listen, you can pay. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's get that out. The line is filled and call the other number. Yeah. They were doing that for a couple of weeks, but now, if you call the old number, it'll say it's full and you can pay. I just want everybody to know that's not us. They're taking advantage of the old number, and, it's a, and we're not getting any payments. So please take note of the new number that he's going to get. New number, new calling number for MHHS, that's why I is 319 527 6751. 319 527 6751. The other announcement that I want to make is about, is again about the Moist Mass Grade Ball. It will be April 1st, it will be here in Philadelphia. Um, then I'm hoping everybody signed in. But I'm gonna send out I'm gonna send out a mass text. We gotta get the flyer put together. We'll have that put together tonight. And I'll send out a mass text to everybody so everybody will have the, uh, the donation information. It's only 35 dollars And um, it'll be at Temptation Banker Hall. If anybody knows what that is from 9 to 2 on April 1st. Um, you can come in Morris Garb. If you don't come in Morris Garb, then you gotta come in formal dress. No exceptions. No jeans, no sweatpants, no sneakers, no boots, no nothing. Say the name again, please. Say the name of what? It's at Temptations Hall. Temptations Hall. I'm thinking that's 218 West Shelton Avenue. But like I said, the flyer, I'll, I'll get the flyer done tonight, tomorrow morning, and then you'll all have information by tomorrow. You'll be able to go onto the site, you'll be able to make a donation to the site and print your tickets at the site. Um, the next class is February 11th, so until then, Peace, love, and Islam. One, one, one more, one more announcement. Sister Lisa, 